So welcome everyone. My name is Janet Noodleman. I'm the Director of Program and Policy for Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, and I'm also the Director of our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. And I have the great pleasure of welcoming you today on behalf of our two organizations and the American Sustainable Business Council to today's Congressional Staff Briefing on the need for federally mandated fragrance and flavor ingredient disclosure in personal care and beauty products. Today, we are going to be having a virtual Zoom briefing. I wish we could be there in person, although I heard you have a lot of snow that's coming down in Washington, DC. So maybe the, the virtual element of today's uh, briefing is a good thing. So welcome. We have a really, really great presentation in store for you. But before we get started, I would love to go ahead and just introduce the three hosts of today's congressional briefing. Breast Cancer Prevention Partners is the only national organization focused solely on preventing breast cancer by identifying and eliminating the environmental links to the disease and getting cancer-causing chemicals out of consumer products, out of uh, workplace settings, and out of our communities. And our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics has been around for about 17 years, if you can believe it. The campaign was started in 2004, and the focus of the campaign is to raise consumer awareness about the problem of harmful chemicals in beauty and personal care products, increase consumer demand for safer products, increase the marketplace of safer alternatives, urge uh, the cosmetics companies that are um, not doing the right thing to make safer products and move towards safer production and lift up the, the industry leaders. Now I'd love to uh, have David Levine from the ASBC just take a minute or so to introduce his organization. Great, thank you, Janet. And I am David Levine, the co-founder and president of the American Sustainable Business Council. We appreciate the opportunity to join with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, and we're glad that you could join us here today. For those that don't know, the American Sustainable Business Council represents and partners with business organizations and companies to advocate for solutions and policies at the federal and state levels that support an equitable, sustainable stakeholder economy. ASPC and our member organizations collectively represent over 250,000 companies across size, sector, and geographies. As we look to transition our economy to build back better and create a more equitable and sustainable economy, safer chemicals and products provide a smart pathway to a stronger economy and stronger business and job growth. The responsible businesses that we represent understand that it's a false choice to think that we have to choose between profitable business and safer products. Our businesses also understand that greater transparency and accountability should be a hallmark of all business practices, and certainly when it comes to personal care and beauty products. It's time for us to reshape policy, to recognize that good regulations help create clarity for good business planning. It levels the playing field for all businesses. It provides assurance for a concerned public and overall will help to create health and well-being for families, communities, our environment, and a strong environment for business in our economy. So the American Sustainable Business Council is ready to work with all of you to bring about a safer, healthy, more equitable, and sustainable economy and to bring that into reality. So thank you very much, Janet, back to you. Thank you, David, and it's such a pleasure to work with you. I think this is about the third congressional briefing that we've co-hosted together and you have been just an awesome partner and have been doing great work on behalf of environmental health and justice. So thank you for that. So here's what you have to look forward to today. Uh, we have five great speakers who you will be hearing from shortly. who are gonna spend about the first 35 to 40 minutes talking about the health impacts of hidden fragrance ingredients, the consumer right to know aspect of the issue, 
why a major multinational corporation is voluntarily disclosing fragrance ingredients, why fragrance transparency is becoming the new normal for the cosmetics industry, especially for clean cosmetics companies. And then finally, some information about a recently enacted California law, the first of its kind in the, in it, in the nation, uh, that is requiring the public disclosure of fragrance and fra flavor ingredients in cosmetic products. Following the presentations, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and if we run out of time, which we might, I just want to um, uh, invite all of you to stay for a few extra minutes and we will get to whatever questions we weren't able to during the formal Q&A session. So let's get to it. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our five speakers and then the first speaker will kick things off. Um, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Robin Dotson, who's a research scientist at the Silent Spring Institute. Dr. Dotson's research focuses on the exposure, um, our exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds and cancer causing chemicals in consumer products. She completed her doctorate in environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health. And in addition to her position at the Silent Spring Institute, she's also an adjunct assistant professor at Boston University School of Public Health. Next, we'll be hearing from Tia Tomlin. She is an Atlanta-based breast cancer survivor advocate and organizer focused on ending health disparities and improving Black women's health. Uh, she launched an online community to support women living with cancer and co-founded My Style Matters, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting, empowering, advocating, and educating cancer survivors and the community at large about cancer and cancer prevention activities. And Julie Frolicker has been with Procter & Gamble for almost 23 years. She currently serves as a senior director in their global stewardship program and she regularly engages with stakeholders, both at the congressional level, the regulatory level, um, with nonprofit governmental organizations on both US and state-based chemical policy. And I've had the great pleasure of working with Julie on a number of initiatives, and I can attest that she's terrific at what she does. Um, Mia Davis is Credo Beauty's Vice President of Sustainability and Impact. She was at Beauty Counter for five years. She helped to launch that extremely successful clean cosmetics company. And she has consulted for dozens of clean cosmetic brands, almost all of which voluntarily disclose fragrance ingredients. And I'm gonna be your fifth speaker. I am the Director of Program and Policy at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. I have served in this capacity for the past 19 years. And I'm also director of our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, um, which has been around again since 2004. And I've been an advocate and lobbyist on behalf of women's health um, and on behalf of social change issues for approximately 30 years. So that is who you're going to be hearing from today. Next slide, please. So while you're listening to the presentations, if a question occurs to you, please enter it in the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get to it when we get to the Q&A section of today's sub, uh, webinar. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the virtual mic over to Dr. Dotson. Thank you, Janet. Um, good afternoon or good morning, um, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Dr. Robin Dotson and I am a research scientist at Silent Spring Institute. We are a nonprofit research organization that studies environmental chemicals and their impact on health with a particular focus on breast cancer. I came to Silent Spring first as a postdoc after completing my doctorate at the Harvard School of Public Health. And as an environmental health scientist, my research focuses on chemicals used in consumer products in the home and those that are used in the home that are linked to breast cancer and other diseases. I am here today to talk about fragrance ingredients in commonly used personal care products and their associated health effects. There are nearly 4,000 possible chemicals used in fragrance formulations added to products. Next slide. The International Fragrance Association shares this long list of chemicals on their website. 
dozens to hundreds of these chemicals comprise a fragrance formulation added to a certain product. Of these nearly 4,000 chemicals, at least 1,175 would require a label, uh, a warning label, according to the UN's Global Harmonization System, which is a ha hazard communication system. And at least 190 of these chemicals would necessitate a danger label. Notably, at least 25 of these fragrance chemicals are known or possible carcinogens. And at least 21 are considered developmental or reproductive toxicants. And seven are considered both carcinogenic and developmental or reproductive toxicants. Among these hazardous chemicals commonly found in fragrances are phthalates, which are linked to developmental and reproductive toxicity, the volatile organic compound, acetaldehyde, linked to cancer, neurotoxicity, skin and eye and lung toxicity, and the compound styrene, which is both carcinogenic and has endocrine disrupting effects. Yet, these chemicals are used without anyone knowing which products they are used in. Consumers don't know, product manufacturers often don't know, and even the FDA doesn't know which fragrance chemicals are used in which products. Chemicals associated with cancer and or reproductive or developmental toxicity are used in everyday products, hidden behind the catch-all fragrance ingredient label. Consumers have a right to know if harmful chemicals are used in their products. We have a right to know what chemicals are in the products that we use on our bodies and in our children's bodies. Next slide. Exposure to fragrance chemicals is widespread. For example, in our own analysis of product emission data reported to the California's Air Resources Board, emissions of volatile organic compounds from fragranced personal care products is over 11 tons per day in California. This just gives you a sense of the volume of these chemicals in commerce. The majority of personal care products contain fragrance, making it difficult for consumers to opt out of potentially harmful uh, chemical exposures. For example, 96% of shampoos and 98% of conditioners contain fragrance. 87% of body lotions, which we slather all over our body to remain on our skin all day, contain fragrance. We can also see this in our product testing data. Next slide. In our own product testing data, we tested over 20, uh, 200 products for chemicals associated with endocrine disruption and asthma. Of the 66 chemicals that we targeted, we tested for 19 natural or synthetic fragrance chemicals. This is only a small snapshot of the potential fragrance chemicals used in products. These fragrance chemicals include HHCB or galaxolide, which is found in shampoos and conditioners and air fresheners, and HTN, which was found in perfumes, soaps, and deodorant. Both of these synthetic fragrance chemicals have been shown to act like estrogen, the female hormone, in laboratory studies. Now, you might think that these exposures are not relevant since they are, there's only a tiny amount of these chemicals in the products. But we're not exposed to these chemicals in isolation. We're exposed to complex mixtures from multiple products. Exposures add up. Now, you might also think that these exposures to even very small doses don't matter. But we know that even very low doses of our hormonally active chemicals turn out to be particularly significant for pregnant women, infant, and infants, and children whose developing bodies and brains are highly sensitive to small fluctuations in hormonal signals. Now, we know unequivocally that exposures to even very low doses may, of some of these chemicals may increase risk of breast and prostate cancers, neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative diseases, such as, such as ADHD and Parkinson's, metabolic disorders like obesity and diabetes, and reproductive problems, including fertility, uh, infertility and male genital birth defects. In addition to these chronic health effects, two to 11% of the global population suffers from fragrance allergies, which means hundreds of millions of people lack the information they need to avoid substances that can trigger their own allergic reaction. So who is exposed? We all are. 
but the highest users of fragrance products are women and girls, precisely the population most at risk for the health effects from these chemicals. And industry market research indicates that nearly 40% of girls ages six to eight use perfume or body spray. Among women and girls, however, exposures are not equal. Next slide. Let's return to our product testing research. We also tested hair products commonly used by black women. And of these 66 chemicals that we targeted, 39 are considered potential fragrance ingredients. It means they're on the International Fragrance Association list. This includes 19 of the targeted fragrances that I've already talked about, but it also includes several phthalates, parabens, and glycol ethers. Of the 39 potential fragrance ingredients that we looked for, 22 were detected in the products, but were never found on a product label. The most frequent offender was diethyl phthalate, which was found in 14 products but never on the label, presum presumably hidden behind the fragrance catch-all term. Fragrance ingredients disclosure is about the right to know, giving the consumers the information that they need. We've learned from other right to know laws that bo at both the federal and state level that the simple act of having to disclose the use of hazardous chemicals prompts manufacturers to reduce the reliance on those chemicals. So in conclusion, fragrances are ubiquitous, nearly impossible to avoid, Many chemicals used in fragrance formulations have been associated with acute and chronic health effects. Exposure to fragrance chemicals add up and even low doses of exposure can be harmful. Women and children are particularly vulnerable and we see inequalities in exposure to these chemicals. Fragrance ingredients disclosure will help reduce exposures to harmful chemicals and protect the health of those most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dotson. That was awesome. We now have the great pleasure of welcoming Tia Tomlin, who's going to share a few words with us as a breast cancer survivor and, and advocate on behalf of women's health. Thank you, Tia. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Janet and Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and Dr. Dotson for sharing this information. My name is Tia Tomlin, and I'm a breast cancer survivor. I'm an advocate. I'm the co-founder of My Style Matters, a nonprofit organization that provides support for cancer patients living in the greater Atlanta area. And in 2015, I was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. I was under the age of 40, and like many, I was completely distraught. And I wondered how, why, and where did this breast cancer come from? I had little knowledge about this disease and learned that some women actually have a genetic mutation that puts them at a higher risk for developing breast cancer. But that wasn't my case and that wasn't my story. I wasn't a part of that five to 10% of women with this genetic mutation. Rather, I was a part of the 90% of women who were left questioning, where did it come from? I began to look at my environment and the things I was exposed to. And one of the things that stood out for me was my use of fragrance. I was the type of consumer that if the bottle was pretty, I would buy it. I love to smell good and love to have the environment around me to smell good as well. And it was a big part of me. Everything that I purchased had some type of fragrance. My daily routine not only included wearing makeup that consisted of fragrance, but I also used fragrant body wash with the matching lotion and body spray. And throughout the day, I would freshen up. But after hearing the words, it's cancer, and with my past knowledge as a chemist, I knew immediately that I need to make some changes. So what did I do? Well, I got a box and I discarded everything in my home in that box, every household product, every beauty product, and all of my personal care items into that box. And I started to educate myself about the use of these products and it's linked to breast cancer. This is a big issue, especially for black women. Not only are we three times more likely to be diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer, but we are 40% more likely to die from this disease. And as a cancer survivor, one of our biggest fears is the fear of recurrence. Hear those dreadful words again, it's cancer. When we look at some of the contributing factors for breast cancer, Black women are overexposed to extremely toxic chemicals especially in the products that are marketed to us like relaxers and straighteners and hair dyes. 
And in fact, the sister study conducted by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences showed that Black women who frequently use hair dye face a 60% increased risk of breast cancer versus 8% in white women. This is unacceptable. Black women are the largest consumers when it comes to personal care items and or beauty products. We spend nine times more than our non-Black counterparts. And studies have shown that not only are the products used by Black women more dangerous, but we are using them more, which then creates even a bigger problem in terms of the secret fragrance that we use daily. When you look in our communities, there are beauty supply stores everywhere. And many, if not all of the products sold there are unhealthy and contain a combination of these unknown chemicals that are causing harm to many of us that we call fragrance. What we need and what we want is full fragrant disclosure. And as Dr. Dotson said, we have a right to know. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And by federally mandating fragrance ingredient disclosure, this will help, us take, help take us one step closer to preventing breast cancer by giving us information we need to avoid major sources of ongoing and overexposure of some of the most toxic substances in the world, if not on the planet. As a black woman, a daughter, an auntie of two beautiful nieces, a friend, a community change agent, and a breast cancer survivor who is facing statistical probability that my risk of breast cancer could be increased simply because of the personal care choice products that I use, it's just not okay. Information is power, and we as consumers want and deserve fragrance ingredient disclosures so that we can make informed decisions, safer purchases, and live a healthier life. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was really awesome. Thank you so much. All right, next up, we're gonna be hearing from Julie Frolicker from Procter & Gamble. Julie. You have my slide deck. There it is, great. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Frolicker. And as Janet said, I'm a Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at PNG, and I'm joining you today from a very snowy Cincinnati, Ohio. So next slide, please. So P&G, as the world's largest consumer product company, and we're the manufacturer of many of these well-known and trusted household and personal care products, you might ask yourself, um, why is P&G, first of all, participating in this briefing today? And um, what is our commitment to transparency? So if you could go to the next slide, please. So in August of, of 2017, P&G made an announcement that we were committed to disclosing the ingredients in our product fragrances down to 0.01%, which is equivalent to 100 parts per million by the end of 2019. And we did meet that deadline. So at the time of this announcement, this was a pretty novel and exciting announcement because we were the first um, large multinational type company to make this type of transparency commitment to disclose fragrance ingredients across our entire North American product portfolio. So this included products we sold both in the United States and Canada. Now, since that time, we've had other multinational companies join us in this transparency commitment, including companies like Unilever and J&J. &J. So next slide, please. So at PNG, transparency has really been a journey for us that started several years ago. So in 2012, we began by disclosing full product, our full product fragrance palette. So what this means is basically the full menu of fragrance ingredients that our formulators use to make fragrances that we use in our products. Um, and P&G is somewhat unique compared to our peer set of other consumer product companies because we make many of our own fragrances. We have fragrance scientists on staff 
and we make um, these fragrances that we use in our own products. And we also sell those fragrances to other companies. In 2016, we expanded on our transparency journey by providing the full list of fragrance materials that we do not use. And all of this information is available online on pg.com, our corporate website. And then this step was followed by our August 2017 announcement where we committed to providing fragrance ingredients for each product in North America down to 0.01%. So next slide, please. So you may ask yourself, why would we do this? <laughs> At PNG, we um, kind of live by the motto that consumer is boss. So we spend a lot of time getting to know our consumers. A lot of research effort is spent understanding our consumers' interests, their preferences, how they use our products um, and their habits. And we found from our consumer research that consumers want to know what ingredients are used in their products, especially for products that they purchase for use on their bodies or in their bodies, and importantly, around their families and children. So we found that transparency really builds greater trust with our consumers, um, trust in the quality and the safety of our products. So we committed to providing clear, reliable and accessible information to our consumers and making sure that they always had a choice. So we provide a broad assortment of products that include both fragranced and non-fragranced products so that there's always a choice for our consumers. Next slide, please. So the content of these fragrance disclosures can be found in a couple of places. Uh, for example, if a consumer is interested in the fragrance used in an herbal essence shampoo, that consumer can go on to our PNG branded page for herbal essence, which is herbalessences.com, to find the fragrance disclosure there. The consumer can also um, use their smartphone in this great app called Smart Label to find the same information. Smart Label is an app where a consumer can scan a QR code on the product label or a UPC code or search by product brand name or the product name to get at these ingredient disclosures by product. And so the disclosures include both the proper ingredient name for each of the fragrance ingredients, as well as an explanation of why that ingredient is there. So the disclosure explains either the aroma that the ingredient imparts or the function that, it's, that it performs within the fragrance. So next slide, please. So at PNG, we continue to think of transparency as a journey. And this is one that we continue to progress on. We're not finished yet. We know our consumers want this information. And by providing this information, we found that it builds trust between consumers and, and PNG. And it also really strengthens and inspires brand loyalty. So thank you for listening and I'll hand it back to Janet. Thank you so much, Julie, that was great. And I would love to turn the virtual mic over to Mia Davis. From Hello. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, what a great lineup. I'm really enjoying this. So I'm Mia Davis. I'm the VP of Sustainability and Impact for Credo. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about Credo. Um, in 2015, we opened our first store in our hometown of San Francisco. And we started the business because we cared about clean and about beauty and about doing things in a, a really um, fun, inclusive, welcoming way, but that really kind of change the way that people think about the ingredients that are in their products and about their entire experience with the product vis-a-vis uh, -vis it being clean. We knew that we needed to define clean in order to make sure that it really had uh, meaning for Credo, for the 130 brand partners that we sell in our stores across the country and online at credobeauty.com. And in order to really um, change the supply chain to address some of the real challenges that we've already talked about today, especially in Dr. Dodson's presentation. So we developed something called the Credo Clean Standard, 
Uh, we're super proud of it. We believe that it's really strong definition and vision for clean. And we really um, truly welcome other stakeholders to adopt our definition because we know that even though we are the largest clean beauty retailer, we're also um, still pretty small and uh, we need to be speaking the same language in order to really move the needle on safety, sourcing, sustainability and ethics um, as it relates to ingredients, products and packaging. And fragrance is really huge here because um, we can kind of hit on all of these points when we talk about fragrance and the lack of disclosure around this ingredient. We know that there can be hundreds, usually dozens, could be hundreds, could be thousands technically of ingredients that are used um, under the term fragrance. And we need to know a lot more about their safety, their sourcing, uh, their sustainability and ethics. And how can we do any of that if we don't have greater transparency? Next slide, please. So um, the way that this relates to the Credo Clean Standard is that we have this kind of chapter that we call our fragrance transparency policy. And it has two important uh, parts to it. The first is that we require every single brand that we partner with to categorize fragrance. Now we would like full ingredient disclosure. So for fragrance to be broken down into all of its constituent parts. Um, that's our preference. We're really clear about that. Um, but we know that some brands would rather keep fragrance um, ingredients proprietary or that they have a really hard time accessing all of the fragrance ingredients from their fragrance supplier. So even though we're incentivizing full transparency, and I'll get to that in a minute, we decided that we needed to have kind of this baseline, just what, what is the uh, greatest amount of information that we can absolutely mandate across all of our categories. So not just the fragrance juice category, as we call it, the body sprays, the perfumes, the colognes, um, but home fragrance and candles, body um, lotions, serums, everything, makeup, everything that you would use on your body. Well, we decided we needed to require categorization. So what categorization is, is that our brands go back to their suppliers and find out if the fragrance is um, natural, naturally derived, synthetic, uh, essential oil, or is it an unscented, totally unfragranced product? And then on our product pages on our website or in the store, if you're working with one of our clean beauty experts, you can find out what type of fragrance is in that product. And this matters to a lot of our customers because a lot of Credo uh, fans are coming in seeking either unscented fragrance, or I'm sorry, unscented products or natural or naturally derived. So at a bare minimum, we're able to provide this information to anyone who walks in or anyone who visits us at credobeauty.com. And then that's, so that's everybody, right? Every single product, but then we're encouraging full transparency. So the brands that we are partnering with that are um, disclosing every single ingredient that is intentionally used in its fragrance um, will get the special designation on our product pages. We have a landing page where we highlight those brands because it's it's challenging, it's hard for them to do. Um, we threw a really great event called um, our Mission in Action event in New York um, pre, pre COVID obviously, where we had some um, of our, our brands that were fully disclosing and the scientists uh, from Mount Sinai speak to this very issue that we're talking about today, the challenges, the needs, why we need to be pushing the market for greater transparency. So we're really celebrating the brands that are going the extra mile to fully disclose. I also wanna note that no matter what kind of fragrance you're using at Credo, it has to be compliant with our dirty list, which is our restricted substance list. Um, it's a very robust list, over 2,700 ingredients on that list. And as it relates to fragrance, uh, we must be free of phthalates. Well, for all of the product, but particularly these are common ingredients in fragrance blends, free of phthalates, free of two types of synthetic masks, which are uh, polycyclic and nitro masks. So these are some of the ingredients that Dr. Dodson uh, mentioned earlier. And the brands must be IFRA compliant. Next slide, please. So how are we doing with this? Um, you know, we, we require the categorization. How are we doing with the incentivized full disclosure? Really well. 70% of the brands that we partner with at Credo are either unscented or are fully disclosing all of the fragrance ingredients that make up their blend. Um, and again, this is an example, this um, pretty little image over to the right is how we're celebrating these brands on social and in stores so that we can really educate the customer about why this matters 
and really hold up the brands that are doing the right thing, going the extra mile to be um, radically transparent with their ingredients. But I will say that this is a real challenge for a lot of our brands. It's not very easy. Um, a lot of the partners that we work with get their products formulated at something that's called a contract manufacturer. And the contract manufacturers are using fragrance houses or fragrance suppliers that are um, up until now have not maybe been so willing or incentivized to disclose their ingredients. So some of our brand partners, when we approached them, you know, in 2017, when we were gearing up to launch our Credo Clean Standard, we approached them about their willingness to disclose. The brands themselves were like, yes, absolutely. We're, we're selling at Credo because we believe in clean and we believe in all these tenants of clean. And actually, I think we're already using just a totally natural fragrance that should be easy. And then they found out that it wasn't easy and the fragrance houses and the suppliers were not willing to disclose down to these incredibly low levels that um, Procter & Gamble that Julie just mentioned, um, which is you know amazing that P&G has taken on um, transparency and disclosure to this level. Um, a lot of the smaller companies don't have the weight of Procter & Gamble and the fragrance houses were like, no, we don't get to know what's in the blend that you're buying from us and using in your product, which has your name on it and all the liability or risk um, for better or worse lies with the brand. So that's been an interesting challenge. And um, so I completely echo that this is a consumer right to know issue. It's also a, a brand customer right to know issue. And um, since we're here with you know, breast cancer prevention partners, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics and the American Sustainable Business Council, it's clear that we are pro-business and pro-small business too. We need to be making sure that um, some of the indie brands that are really leading the clean category have the right to, to this information, just like um, some of the bigger multinationals. So um, last slide, please. Um, in conclusion, I just wanted to mention that um, Credo is the only retailer that is requiring categorization and incentivizing disclosure. But with all the other things that we're doing on clean and with fragrance, we really wanna link arms with other retailers and other stakeholders to make sure that we're just moving the needle together. Uh, we're certainly stronger together and policy will only help to encourage um, more innovation, more, you know, greater access to safer, more sustainable ingredients. And, um, you know, to echo uh, something that I think both um, Dr. Dodson and Tia mentioned earlier, you know, if, if we have greater transparency, we've empowered not only the customer and the brand, but we have um, made sure that um, companies are going to think twice about using ingredients that have been linked to harm or that have less of a sustainability, um, you know, that have sustainability concerns. If they have to disclose it, we're going to start to see a lot more safety and a lot more focus on sustainability. So that's why we um, we're really driving for this. We just believe it's in the best interest of all constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mia. That was really, that was very provocative. And thank you for all you've done within the clean cosmetics industry to really raise the profile of this issue. So I'm going to dive in now. Um, as I said, my name is Janet Noodleman. I'm the Director of Program and Policy at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and also the Director of our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. You've heard from the other speakers about the breadth and the depth of the problem. What I'm gonna do is dig into the current regulatory landscape. Next slide, please. And I'd, I'd like to remind folks in the meantime to, um, to um, uh, submit any questions you have for the speakers that you've heard so far um, into the Q&A box, because when I'm done with my presentation, we will um, go ahead and field some questions. So fragrance and flavor ingredients by the numbers. Uh, just taking a look at some of these numbers, you can see that this is a really big industry that we're talking about, which is translating into a really big problem. Um, so we know somewhere between 10,000 and 12,500 chemicals are used to formulate the beauty and personal care products we use every day. Um, but in addition, um, and some of these, these chemicals are, are actually um, have different functional purposes, so they might be the same. There are 4,000 chemicals, as Dr. Dotson said, that are currently in use to make our beauty and personal care products smell good, 
Um, another 3,000 chemicals that are used in our mouthwash and toothpaste and chapstick to make those products taste good. Um, we're talking about a $70 billion global fragrance and flavor uh, industry. So we're talking about a lot of chemicals and a really big industry that self-regulates itself. In fact, there is no existing state, federal, or international regulation of any kind that uh, provides oversight or guidance as to the safety of the fragrance and flavor ingredients in the beauty products that we use every day. Next slide, please. So there's uh, two different laws, federal laws, that guide the disclosure of what um, must appear on a product label of a beauty and personal care product and what is exempt from disclosure. And those two laws are the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which was uh, enacted in 1938, more than 80 years ago, as well as the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, which was enacted in 1966. Um, and what's interesting is unlike cleaning products and food, all of the ingredients have to appear on the product label itself of a cosmetic product with the exception of fragrance, flavor, contaminants, uh, trade secrets, and the ingredients in professional salon products. And I'll just mention that um, in the, the history of all time, there has only ever been one trade secret petition granted uh, by the FDA for, uh, uh, in this case, a formula in a cosmetic product. So, there aren't a lot of trade secrets that are that are being um, doled out other than uh, for flavor and fragrance. Next slide, please. So this is what a product label looks like. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the problem is, as you can see uh, from the right hand side, fragrance and flavor is legally allowed to appear on the product label with just that one word, fragrance or flavor. Um, and that's a real problem for consumers because as we've heard from the other speakers, that one little word can hide anywhere between a dozen to sometimes hundreds of chemicals of concern, depending on the complexity of the, the formulation. Next slide, please. So this is a really good example of the problem. In 2018, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics tested 40 different beauty products and cleaning products for chemicals of concern. And what we discovered is the most toxic product, meaning the product with the highest number of toxic chemicals was a children's shampoo marketed to kids of color called Just For Me by Strength of Nature. And I, I wanna add that this product was even more toxic than the general all purpose cleaner and the um, the carpet spot remover, the tub and tile cleaner. It contained 24 chemicals of concern, which is bad enough. However, 17 of those chemicals were fragrance ingredients that were hidden from public view. So did not show up on the product label. Um, and of those 17 fragrance ingredients, uh, one was a carcinogen, six were reproductive or developmental toxicants, one was a, was a neurotoxicant to cause respiratory harm, and 15 were endocrine disrupting compounds, which is a real problem, especially for young children whose bodies are maturing. Um, and early life exposures we know can set those kids onto uh, the path of, of uh, disease, adult disease later in life. Next slide, please. So Mia touched on this issue, but I wanna spend just another couple seconds um, drilling down and, and communicating. If, if there's nothing else that you remember from any of our presentations, I would love for you to um, remember these words. Um, and that is that the, the lack of fragrance disclosure is in fact a supply chain problem that needs and requires supply chain solutions. As I mentioned, there is no federal or global, globally legislatively mandated fragrance disclosure of any kind. Um, so what that means is that the fragrance suppliers, that the fragrance houses around the world are, are under no legal obligation to disclose 
the ingredients in the fragrance formulations that they sell to cosmetic companies for the majority of the products that we use every day. And that means that the manufacturers themselves, big and small, you know, we're talking about companies, small clean cosmetics companies, all the way to the size of like Unilever, the second largest cosmetic company in the world, um, you know, can't, um, even if they wanted to, um, or sometimes won't disclose fragrance and flavor ingredients to their consumers. Um, uh, and the fragrance industry, interestingly enough, is even fighting disclosure to the FDA, who is their regulatory agency. So that begs the question, how can um, a federal regulatory agency regulate an industry if it doesn't have access to the full universe of chemicals being used by that industry to manufacture the, the products under their purview? And how can individual cosmetic companies, to Mia's point, ensure that all of the ingredients in the products that they make and sell are safe if they don't have access to, to that ingredient information and full ingredient disclosure from their fragrance and flavor suppliers. Next slide, please. So the good news is that on September 30th in California, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 312, the California Cosmetic Fragrance and Flavor Ingredient Right to Know Act into law. And this was a historic first ever law of its kind, literally anywhere in the world. What this new law requires is companies selling beauty or personal care products in California to disclose fragrance and flavor chemicals present in those products that are harmful to human health or the environment. Um, the definition of harmful comes from whether or not those ingredients are present in any of the 23 designated lists uh, that are referenced in the bill. And um, the lists are things like the National Toxicology Program's list of carcinogens and reproductive toxicants, the California's Prop 65 uh, list, um, IARC's list of carcinogens. Uh, but there's also lists of both air pollutants and water pollutants, and a list of the European Union's 26 recognized fragrance allergens. So this information is disclosed to the state's Department of Public Health, who then makes the information available through a publicly accessible database. And uh, the reporting and disclosure will become effective as of January 1st, 2022. So this is a really important and historic um, first ever law, as I mentioned, um, but, but it's, it's not enough. Um, because uh, for everyone to be protected, even though California is the fifth largest economy in the world, we need federally mandated fragrance and flavor ingredient disclosure. Next slide, please. Uh, before I end, I, I just want to mention that what was really noteworthy about this piece of legislation is the broad-based support that it generated. Um, um, really speaking to the point that uh, fragrance and flavor ingredient disclosure is a real crowd pleaser. I mean, people want it and lots and lots of folks support moving in this direction. Um, SB 312 had bipartisan support from Democratic and Republican lawmakers alike, was supported by 60 cosmetic companies, including uh, Clorox, the maker of Burt's Bees, Procter & Gamble, uh, Unilever, um, and uh, about 55 clean cosmetics companies, uh, 75 leading NGO and health associations, including the obstetricians and gynecologists, the pediatricians, the American Cancer Society, and there was no recorded opposition at all. Um, and this is important to remember as we discuss this issue and moving this issue at the federal level, um, even the major trade associations, the Personal Care Products Council and the Fragrance Creators Association removed their initial opposition to the bill in the second um, house. So um, again, this is an issue um, that uh, speaks to all of us, consumers, uh, salon workers, and um, manufacturers, the FDA, 
Uh, but at the end of the day, the California law isn't going to do enough. It's a good start, but we all need and deserve a government that protects all of us uh, from uh, fragrance and flavor ingredients hiding in our personal care and beauty products that may be linked to harm to human health or the environment. So I'm going to stop there, um, ask Emily to put the Q&A slide back on and invite those of you that have not already to submit questions that you may have for any of the speakers in the Q&A box and we'll just go ahead and get started. So let's see. Okay, um, we have a question here. All right. Um, well, here is a question. Um, and this has to do with uh, the supply chain um, issue that was raised a little bit earlier. And, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if both Julie and Mia can speak to this question. You know, we can sort of juxtapose the large a uh, multinational cosmetics company with um, the world's largest retailer of clean cosmetics. Can you speak to whether or not supply chain, the supply chain presents obstacles to you in terms of fragrance and flavor disclosure? Julie, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Mia referenced it earlier, you know, P&G has the weight of P&G behind it to really, um, I would say pressure our upstream suppliers, including raw material suppliers and our fragrance houses that provide us fragrances to provide complete information. And, you know, we're pretty fortunate that we can get that information from our upstream suppliers because we make it a requirement of our contract. Now, I fully recognize that's not the case for many of the smaller companies. They just don't have that kind of weight behind them. And that's one of the reasons that PNG is supportive of federal legislation, because if such a, a requirement was in place at the federal level, it would level the playing field where all companies would be privy to that information from their upstream suppliers. And we see that as a real positive. Thank you. That's awesome. Mia, did you have anything you want to add? Um, I would just um, echo, um, I think what has been said that um, PNG has some amazing standards and is leading the way and has the weight of PNG, and that um, smaller indie brands don't have that weight. And have honestly, um, I've had so many anecdotal, just you know, one on ones with founders that are quite frankly very surprised and very put off by how incredibly difficult it is to get disclosure, um, you know, down to trace levels for all intentionally added ingredients and to make sure, make sure that they can really um, do their own due diligence and, and walk the walk on their commitments, not only for selling at Credo, but because most of these brands that we're partnering with really care about their customers' health and the safety and health of the environment and sustainability. And it is very impossible, or it's next to impossible, if not impossible, to feel like you're doing all, you're taking the work all the way to the level that you need to if you don't have full disclosure on ingredients. Um, so I think it's absolutely a major supply chain issue. And I think that most of the brands that we partner with would, would welcome um, seeing this level of the playing field as Julie mentioned. Thank you. Thank you both so much. So we have a question now for Tia. Um, the, the question is, we've heard from the panelists that there can be dozens or even hundreds of fragrance and flavor ingredients in cosmetic products that the question is, won't this type of disclosure just confuse consumers even more? I can understand where someone would think that it would um, be confusing to the consumer having a list, a laundry list of various chemicals. However, what's most important is that these chemicals are harmful. And I think as organizations like myself and breast cancer, prevention partners educating women on what to look for in these products will give us that, um, you know, that it will actually empower us to really be able to make informed decisions and purchase products that are safer for us. Because ultimately we want to live a healthier life. So 
while there may be a list of them, um, I don't believe that it will cause the confusion as long as we're able to continue to educate and um, allow women to be empowered to make their own decision and not have that decision taken away from them. Could I add on to that? That was such a good response to you. I totally agree with you. I would add that um, there's a couple of like conflicting myths or memes that are out there that are not serving this goal. And one of them is that like, if you see a really long ingredient list on a product that it must be a bad thing, it's not a bad thing. It not necessarily, I mean, if it's full of toxic ingredients, it's a bad thing. If it's full of ingredients that um, have been vetted for safety, it's a great thing because now you have someone who's been vetting for safety and you have disclosure and that's really important. So I think there's just a couple of other, um, you know, myths that are out there that we need to work together um, as scientists and as brands and as organizations to make sure that we're um, kind of busting those myths to help people not be overwhelmed by a long, a long list or a list full of like inky or, you know, these official names that we want everybody to be using when they're talking about fragrance, any ingredient. We don't want to just see like, you know, a wild harvested oil. We want to see the inky so that we can be comparing apples to apples and so that we can make sure that we're um, doing disclosure right. So we need to, we need to do our own education around that. Thank you, Mia. So I would just add that one thing that we've tried to do in our disclosures is also help educate the consumer and try to put the information in context. So not only are we providing that long list of inky names, which can look really confusing, quite honestly, but try to explain why those ingredients are there. What do they do? What, you know, why are they important in the fragrance? So you'll find some of that information in our disclosures as well. And Julie, I wanna just say thank you um, for doing that because that also helps to build trust with the consumer. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so there's there's a couple more questions. I'm going to feel just a couple of these really fast. Uh, they're kind of similar. One is, what are the key actions that Congress and congressional staff members can take to better protect constituents? Um, so so one of the the key actions that uh, members of Congress can take is to um, um, enact federally mandated fragrance ingredient disclosure legislation. And there's two, three big bills that are now moving through Congress um, introduced by Representative Schakowsky, Representative Pallone um, on the House side, and then on the Senate side, uh, Senators Feinstein and Collins. And, and there's only one out of those three bills that requires supply chain disclosure of fragrance ingredients. Um, and, and all of the bills should. All of them should. And that is what all of the panelists today are saying from all of the different vantage points that we're coming from, that, um, that it's, the, it's the 21st century. Um, fragrance disclosure is in fact the new normal and uh, federal cosmetic safety regulation hasn't been updated significantly since 1938. And when it is, fragrance ingredient disclosure needs to be a major part of it. Um, so here's, oh, you know what, let me, let me do this. Um, I should formally um, end uh, this briefing. It is now 1230 West Coast time and 330 East Coast time. We do have a bunch more questions that we weren't able to get to. So what, um, what I'd love to do is invite those of you who can stay to do so, and we'll just go for another um, 10 minutes and answer a few more questions. We will make all of the slides as well as the recording from today's webinar available to all of the participants. So if you have to go, um, you'll still have access to the information you weren't able to stay for. But, um, but I do wanna formally thank all of you for uh, joining us today. I'm sorry that we couldn't see your smiling faces in person. We had such a great mix of congressional staff uh, um, more than a, do a dozen of the clean cosmetics companies that worked with us in California uh, to enact SB 312, some of the, the country's leading uh, national nonprofit organizations, health associations, university researchers, just a really great mix of people, which again speaks to the broad-based appeal of this issue. So thank you. Thank you all for your time. 
and um, we hope to, um, to see you all soon. So I'm gonna take a beat um, and the recording will keep going. And now we'll move into our extended Q&A. So um, it doesn't look like very many people left. So that's another good sign. So here's a question. Uh, this is another question it looks like for Mia and Julie, which is that the two of you have spoke um, quite elo eloquently about the, the market uh, based efforts and activities that are going on um, in terms of voluntary fragrance disclosure. Oh, why shouldn't we just allow the market to drive this issue and take care of the problem? Well, I, I think it does get back to what I was mentioning uh, with the supply chain disclosure, because there is this real redis reticence on the part of um, some of the upstream fragrance houses to provide the, you know, the full information about their fragrances because that's their product. That's what they put all of their intellectual property in and provide and from their viewpoint, providing information about all of the constituents in that fragrance is just kind of giving away their, <laughs> their institutional property. So I understand um, that perspective, but there is a real need for um, more transparency um, in the supply chain to be so that upstream fragrance houses can provide that information to the consumer product company so that we can share that with consumers. Yeah. Yeah, I think the market is doing a good job of answering the call of customers and um, other stakeholders that have shown that there is a real need for greater disclosure. But the market, you know, Janet and I have talked about this for years. The market is the ceiling. The market keeps evolving where we're headed. The market keeps pushing and that is really good. And policy needs to be a safer floor. Right now, the floor for fragrance is really, really, really low. You can hide chemicals that are known to cause harm at low doses in products that you're selling to pregnant women of color, like not okay. So we need to make sure that policy raises the floor so that everyone just has a much higher bar of safety no matter where they're shopping, no matter um, where they live in the country, no matter what their income level or their budget for that purchase is. Um, you know, I think that Procter & Gamble is a great example of having a very accessible product in terms of geography and price point that is committed to disclosure and that's awesome. But that's also because they're so, they're so big, they're so powerful, right? So there's a, a lot of companies that are left in this other space and a lot of customers, other space meaning, you know, without that um, that power, that market share. And then there's um, a lot of customers that are also left in this other space too. Um, so we have to pass policy in order to make sure that we're really moving the needle. And then the market will continue to do better and evolve because once we say that we have greater disclosure, we'll start to shine the light on some of the problematic ingredients. They won't necessarily be prohibited. We're just gonna have a lot more information and then we will have, you know, data scientists, research scientists, policymakers that start to call attention to the fact that um, we need more rules now around some of these particularly egregious toxins and the market will continue to respond. So I think it's a both and for sure. Thank you. Janet, can I just add to that um, sure. from my perspective, especially doing a lot of community-based work that I think that this Fragrance ingredient disclosure is just one of the levers that we should use. The market-based approach is also a very important lever, but why not use all the levers or why not strengthen those levers to use them all? So let's not shift everything onto the market, you know, the burden onto the market. Let's not shift everything to the, the sole consumer, you know, the mom going to the store trying to find a product that's safe. Or, you know, let's not shift it all to, you know, who who knows right the policy i guess but I, I guess we need to have all of those lined up together um and working efficiently together thank you that's um i think that's a great point so there is another question i'm going to take this one that asks it sounds like the california law is a great model should we simply codify it at the federal level um and the answer to that is um yes and no um, the California law is currently the strongest in the world. Um, it's the only in the world, um, but it, it is the strongest, but it's still not enough because it only requires the disclosure of the fragrance and flavor ingredients that are harmful 
to human health or the environment. And what Procter and Gamble and Credo Beauty and hundreds of other clean cosmetics companies, um, as well as Unilever, have proven is that more is possible. Um, so what we, we need is the California Law Plus um, so that consumers also have access to the other um, non-hazardous fragrance and flavor ingredients in their products so that they can make uh, more informed choices. Um, and, and again, I just wanna point out that um, Unilever and Procter and Gamble are disclosing non-hazardous fragrance and flavor ingredients at or above 100 parts per million. Um, Credo Beauty and, and many of the other clean cosmetics companies are, are disclosing down to zero parts per million. But again, more, more is possible. Um, so we have, a, we have a question for Robin, and that is if fragrance doesn't appear on an ingredient level, I'm sorry, if the word fragrance doesn't appear on an ingredient label, does that mean that the product doesn't include fragrance? Um, unfortunately, not necessarily, um, because sometimes uh, chemicals are added, fragrance chemicals are added to mask the smell um, of some of the constituents inside of that product. So unfortunately, that only gets us so far. Um, and so rather, if we knew every chemical that was in that product, um, we could make more informed decisions. Okay, perfect. So now we have a question from Earth Mama Organics, um, who says, while we don't use fragrance chemicals, we do use essential oils for scent, um, which are in fact fragrance chemicals. They're just not synthetic. Um, that, that was my um, additional point. But her question is, um, we're wondering if you're looking for allergen information for essential oils, for example, um, linalool and, um, and other uh, fragrance allergens. And this question was from Mia. Yeah, I think that the um, Earth Mama um, means uh, essential oils is really um, the purest and most whole kind of category of fragrance ingredients because there are also natural and naturally derived and then synthetic constituents. So I think that they're probably making the point that they're um, making a commitment there. They feel that they're going above and beyond, which I would agree that essential oils tend to be, while they're more expensive and harder to work with, they tend to be the closest to nature. Um, and often you can get the most information and most purity information around those ingredients, depending on your supplier. Um, so that's probably why they've chosen to go that path. Also, because they have organics in their name and that's the only fragrance ingredient that you could actually certify as organic and fully disclose. Um, but it, with regard to the allergen question, so yeah, Janet, you mentioned um, the EU allergens. There are 26 that are um, commonly found in fragrance, whether it's essential oils or natural or naturally derived or synthetic, you can uh, encounter these, um, these allergens. And that's because um, they're pre present in plants, but they can also be extracted as isolates and then kind of put back into fragrance to rebuild the fragrance palette, to rebuild the scent. And um, the EU as a part of their um, efforts around disclosure requires that these 26 are listed when they're at a certain level. And we don't have that in the United States. Um, Credo, since the question was directed to me, I imagine that it's about if Credo's policy. We don't have a policy on the disclosure of the allergens. That could be like a whole separate, uh, a whole separate <laughs> briefing or webinar. Um, I've, I've never had a customer come up to me or someone in, in my entire life of doing this saying, I have a real linalool problem. I'm really allergic to linalool. So I'm searching for something without that. So while I'm all about transparency and all about disclosure, as I hope is abundantly clear from participating in this uh, briefing, I, I don't put a lot behind the 26 EU allergens being a really important part of disclosure personally. It's an, and it's at Credo, like if you're EU compliant and it's on your label, that's fantastic, um, but it's not required. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you for that, Mia. So one more question, and then I'm gonna go ahead and um, ah, there's two more questions. I'll field these quickly, and then I'm gonna just let um, uh, each of the speakers have the final word in terms of anything they'd like to leave you with, any thoughts they'd like to leave you with. Um, so one question is what other chemicals 
uh, should we be avoiding um, in cosmetic products? That's, that, that could, could be the subject of an entire webinar itself. Um, as I alluded to earlier, there is only two and a half pages of federal law in existence today to regulate um, a hundred billion dollar domestic cosmetics industry. And, um, and that existing law is um, severely lacking. So that means companies can and do, not all companies, but some companies that treat cosmetic safety as if it's the wild west can and do use um, legally chemicals linked to cancer, birth defects, reproductive harm, endocrine disruption, et cetera, in the beauty and personal care products we use every day. Um, so it's really important for consumers to self-educate themselves. Um, I'm not um, able to go through a list of, of all of the chemicals you, sh you should um, avoid. However, there are apps like Think Dirty, um, um, EWG Skin Deep, um, Clearia's, um, um, uh, a web extension called Clearia that you can use to both educate yourself as to what chemicals you should avoid and educate yourself as to where those chemicals are showing up, what kinds of products um, you can find them in. So who's fighting this uh, fragrance and flavor disclosure effort? Well, um, at the federal level, we've seen opposition come from primarily the trade associations, the Personal Care Products Council and the Fragrance Creators Association. We're hoping with the passage of the California law, since they didn't oppose that law, um, that they will be supportive of, of bringing the show on the road and, um, and again, uh, codifying fragrance and flavor ingredient disclosure at the federal level. Also, so, some of the big companies that make fine fragrances have also been fighting federal fragrance ingredient disclosure like Chanel, for example. Um, this is interesting because what we've seen is there's a line of fine fragrances that were released by Michelle Pfeiffer called Henry Rose. And um, they disclose all of the individual constituent ingredients in their fine fragrances and they're all EWG verified safe. So again, um, what we're seeing is a fragrance disclosure even for the most complicated fragranced products is possible. So I want to just go ahead and invite any of the, the panelists that have a, a final word that they'd like to leave us with on this issue to do so. Um, well, I would, I thank you all so much for um, having me join this great panel and for all of your attention today. Um, I know everyone's schedule is really busy and this topic is really important. So I'm glad you're here. And I would just ask, um, you know, we had a couple of questions earlier about, you know, whose responsibility is this, or is this confusing for customers, for consumers? Um, I would flip it and just say like, who stands to gain if we don't do this, right? So um, I think that's an important thing to, to, leave, to leave on. Robin, do you have anything to add? No, just to that point as well, as I think it's really important to think about the people who aren't at the table, right? So people who, children, um, children yet to be born. I mean, all these kind of future generations where these low level exposures to these endocrine disrupting chemicals can have some dramatic and drastic effects um, on their lifelong health. And uh, Tia, do you have anything to add? Yes, I just want to echo. First, I want to say thank you so much. And this has been very informative. And just keep up the good work. I mean, for everyone who's tuned in, you know, continue to learn, continue to educate, continue to advocate so that we can make sure that women um, are living a healthier life and that our young girls don't have to hear the word breast cancer in their lifetime. So thank you. And how about you, Julie? Just again, thank you for having me. And just consumers want to make informed choices. So let's help them do that. And that's what transparency is all about. Thank you. And I want to um, let you all know, we're going to be putting up a slide with the contact information for all of the speakers. So if you want to just um, hang tight for about another minute, you'll see it up. There it is up on the screen. So I want to invite all of you to, to please contact any of us directly if you have a question that wasn't answered. 
Um, I want to invite you to stay in touch with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners and our Campaign for Safe Cosmetics because we're continuing to advocate at the federal level for cosmetic safety legislation, um, including full fragrance and flavor ingredient disclosure to protect consumers and salon workers, to protect all of us, regardless of where we live and what products we buy from unsafe chemicals and the beauty and personal care products we use every day. And you can learn more by visiting our websites. And I really, really wanna thank um, the, the big multinationals, Procter & Gamble and Unilever that are really leading the way on this issue. You have raised a high bar for your industry. You really have. And it just speaks volumes to what's possible. And I wanna thank the clean cosmetics industry because you have grown exponentially over the last decade to respond to consumer demand for more transparency, for safer products, and you are an inspiration to all of us. So thank you again for, for leading the way. And thank you to all of you. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Uh, we're looking forward to the pandemic ending so we can all gather in person for our next congressional briefing. But until then, thank you for your time and attention. And thank you in advance for your own advocacy on behalf of this important issue. Have a great day.